Matthew 8, verse 16. Resting in the storm and preparing, an, uh, preparing a house for the coming of the Lord. But this passage in Matthew 8 and Mark 4 is about how to rest, how to be at peace, and how to speak to mountains, speak to our circumstances, and speak peace. Matthew 8, 16 says, When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. When, when did Jesus do that? When evening had come. What's significant about evening time? It's a time of rest. You work for the day, you go home. Evening is, is kind of the end of the work day. So in the season of rest, that day, miracles happen. So what Jesus did happened at evening time, happened at the time of rest. Not by might, not by power, by striving, but by his spirit. Right now, the same thing, in, you don't have to turn, but Mark 4, 35, it says, on the same day when evening had come, he said, let us cross over to the other side. Twice. You see the phrase when evening had come. So it's a reminder that we need to stay in God's peace. Stay in God's rest. Number one, so that we can do the works of God. Number two, so that we can hear him clearly. Because when evening had come, then Jesus spoke. And what did Jesus speak in Mark 4, 35? Let us cross over to the other side. You know, the first two words he said was, let us. Remember when we heard that first, the Bible? Genesis, right? Let there be, let us make man, let there be light. And now Jesus is saying, let us cross over. Equally powerful. He prophesied that they are going to cross over. When evening had come. Before the storm, before there was any problem, he gave the promise. You see, God always gives us his promises before anything happens. I mean, I don't know how many of you notice this, but you get a very powerful prophetic word, then everything happens. Then you say, oh, now I know God why you gave me the word so I can hang on to it. Like a light in the dark place. Right? So in the evening time, Jesus prophesied, let us cross over. We know the story. They left the multitude. They got into the boat with him. There were other boats following. Verse 37, and a great storm. Now, you are still in Matthew 8. I want you to read verse 28. At the age 28, when Jesus had come, when he had come to the other side, so promise fulfilled. He said, let us cross over. Now he's crossed over. When he had come to the other side, to the country of Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs. And how were they described? Exceedingly. Now what does that description remind you of? The storm they've just been through. It was an exceedingly fierce storm. Just like the demons in these two men. Two possessed men came out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass that way. Just as no normal boat could pass through that storm. Verse 29, And suddenly they cried out saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, the Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? So the demons begged him saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. So when they come out, they went to the herd of swine. The whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for opening the ears of our spirit to hear you. May our minds be renewed, our hearts transformed, release revelation and faith that comes by hearing. The Rema word, Lord. We thank you for faith. We thank you for revelation, for understanding, for wisdom, for transformation in Jesus' name. So something tells me that the demons in these two men discerned the direction of Jesus' boat. The minute Jesus got into the boat, I think the demon knew he's heading that way. So they better try and stop him. And sometimes when things happen, the enemy knows our direction, where God is taking it. Why? He's heard the prophecies. He's heard the promises. He's heard the great plans that God has given over you, over your family, over your church, over the nation. And so he knows that when God speaks, Psalm says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. So the enemy has heard all the prophecies. He knows where the boat is heading. And so I believe that this pandemic, one of the reasons it has happened has, because he knows what's waiting on the other side. Some demons are about to leave, some trombos are about to be broken, and people are about to set free throughout the world. And he can see that coming. So he's trying to shake the church. 
is trying to shake every boat with Jesus in the boat. So that's good news, isn't it? The, the enemy knows new Jesus is coming. He sent the storm. You know, 1 Corinthians 15 says, first the natural, then the spiritual. First the natural Adam, then the spiritual Adam Christ. First a physical baby is born, and then the spiritual, you're born again. So first the natural storm in the wind and the waves, and then the spiritual storm on the demon-possessed guys. So you see, God is speaking, he's doing something. And what are we to learn through this season? Firstly, the good news is, we are going to cross over because Jesus said, let us cross over. He said, good things are going to happen. There's going to be a revival. There's going to be a move of God. He's going to do amazing things in the nations, including Malaysia and Penang. That's why we are here. Right? Why, why is my family here? Because God spoke to dad 41 years ago and brought us here 40 years ago. Why? Because in that vision, in other words, he showed dad the other side. What's the other side? Island filled with banners, filled with flags. Saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But that was the other side. So these 40 years is like you've been preparing and planning to cross over. Like this is the final, the Jordan season before the promises to be fulfilled. So even as the Israelites had to cross over, the same way Jesus had to cross over. Under Joshua, what did the Israelites have to do? They had to follow the ark. What did the disciples with Jesus have to do? Follow the ark of Jesus, the presence of God. What else did the Israelites do under Joshua? They had to pick up stones, one stone per tribe. Each, each head of the tribe had to pick up a stone. Why? As a testimony to their children, the children's children. They say, this is what the Lord done. He, he opened the way for us to cross the Jordan River. What was Jesus doing in the boat during the storm? Sleeping on a stone. You know. What's the first mention of the house of God in Genesis 28? Jacob stepped on the pillow. He poured oil at the end of the chapter. and said, this is the house of God. See, God wants to build a house of rest. But to build a house of rest, he's allowing a shaking, just like Moses saw the burning bush because everything that could be burned was burned up. What was left behind could not be burned. The bush was a flame. The God is shaking the world. In uh, Hebrews, it talks about the shaking in Haggai. Why? To speak to us, to reveal to us where our foundation, where our anchor is. Because, you know, if you never experience anything, it's easy to think our peace and our joy, because, you know, God is so good because things are so good. Right? Many times our perception of God is based on our experiences. You don't have problems, God is a good God. You have problems, God, what's wrong with you? Huh? Why you let this happen? And if nothing happened, it's easy to think that your peace comes from the Lord. But when will you find out when things are shaken, then you realize, hey, I thought my peace was from the Lord, but it's obviously from my circumstances. You see, maybe the disciples on the boat thought that they were so blessed following Jesus. They thought, yeah, you know, we are so, so full of peace and joy because we are walking close to the Lord. And so maybe Jesus slept longer than he should have to show them that their peace was not from him or from good weather. If the weather never turned bad, they would have thought their peace came from him when actually their peace came from great weather. And so many Christians, if nothing happens, think they're enjoying the presence of God when all they are is happy. You know why? Because happiness comes from happy happenings. But joy comes from his presence. That's why joy is called the joy of the Lord, not the joy of circumstances. So God doesn't allow things to shake. We, we don't know our foundation. So God has allowed the world to shake and, and we are seeing the foundation that close of many believers. You see so many believers full of fear, like the disciples. God, aren't you concerned that we are drowning? And what is the Lord waiting for? What is our Father waiting for us? To do what Jesus was hoping his disciples would do, which is to enter his rest. To have the same peace that he had. You know why? Because unless we learn to enter his rest, we cannot stop, stop the storm. We have no authority to speak peace. What are most Christians doing today? God, stop the pandemic so that we can be at peace. The Lord is saying, no, you'll be at peace so that you can stop the pandemic. The disciples said, wake up, Jesus, stop the storm. They said, why are you waking me? You should have done it yourself. You enter my rest and speak. Why are you asking me to speak? There's so many of us today all over the world. I say, God, stop the storm. And he says, no, no, no. You have the authority, but you must first enter my rest. And so that's the challenge of the season is, God wants his people to enter his rest. You know why? Because he wants us to build a house of rest. You know who, he, who built the house for him in the Old Testament? Was it David? No, it was Solomon, his son. Even Acts 7.47 says, But Solomon built him a house. 
You know why God chose Solomon to build him a house? He answers in his name. The purpose of Solomon was revealed prophetically in his name. 1 Chronicles 22, verse 9 to 12. Speaking of Solomon, it says, The son shall be born to you. Speaking about Solomon, who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies all around. His name shall be Solomon. For I will give peace and quietness to Israel in his days. Wow. So why, how did peace and quietness come to Israel? Because the leader of Israel was the man of rest. So because God wanted peace in the land, he put a leader for the man of peace. Verse 10. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall, and he shall be my son. And I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, may the Lord be with you, and may you prosper, and build the house of the Lord your God as he has said to you. Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding, and give you charge concerning Israel, that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. So God wanted peace in the land. He to raise up a leader of peace. He allowed Solomon to be conceived to the, as a kind of a redemption of what David lost with Bathsheba. Right? The child conceived out of wedlock through murder and adultery, died. And Solomon was a restoration. A man of wisdom was born to the greatest foolish decision of David. See, there's always redemption and restoration. And this son that, that God conceived in the womb of Bathsheba be a man of peace so that Israel would have peace. Be a man of rest. You know, many Christians only see Solomon as he was a very wise man, right? You ask someone, hey, when, when, when I mention Solomon, what do you think of? You say wisdom. Someone else will say, oh, he was very rich. Yes. But very few believers know Solomon as a man of rest and peace. The only thing of Solomon in terms of his wisdom and his wealth. But you know, you can't separate wisdom and wealth. You know why? Because Proverbs 24, verse 3 and 4 says, Through wisdom a house is built, just like God chose Solomon to build a house, by understanding it is established, and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So the house of God, the house that God is building is built on wisdom, it is established on understanding, and it is full of provision. And Solomon fit the bill in all three. He was a man of wisdom, he had great understanding. He had wealth beyond measure. But he was a man of rest. So the house of God is building is a house of rest. Why? Because without rest, we have no authority to speak peace over the land. Without rest, we have no authority to release the glory of God to cover the land. And why do many Christians not have rest? Because they are distracted by what the devil is doing. Like the disciples, they are distracted by the wind and the waves. Like Peter is distracted from looking at Jesus to looking at the wind and the waves. But the good example is Noah was a man of rest. His name means rest. Just like Solomon means rest, so does Noah. So Noah's ark means an ark of rest, or a house of rest. And so the peace of God upon Noah rested upon his whole family to be saved. So God wants us to build that house. That's why in Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, he moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Isn't that interesting? He did not prepare an ark for the saving of everybody else living there, for the saving of the human population. Sounds quite selfish, isn't it? But you know what? God knew that only his family believed in him, that the peace of God would rest upon them. He found everybody else was corrupt and wicked. And so God prepared an ark for the saving of his family and the animals two by two. Now, what's the ark for us? You know, the ark in Noah's time. Was, was foolishness to everybody else because there would be no rain until that time. So no rain, no no thunderstorm, no lightning. What is this big boat? Noah, what structure is it? They've never seen a boat before. And like that today, you know what many people think is foolish? Why oh, you all waste time going to church? Huh? You only have two days all a week, relax, huh? Sunday morning, stay home. Sleep in, watch TV, have church, you and God alone enough. Put the internet on, watch a meeting. No need to meet with anybody like Really, like you now, not church, now it's kingdom. Now you're one kingdom, no need church. You know what that's like saying? Don't need your house, live at the office. It's the office, it's the marketplace, don't go home. Make your office your home. Carry your way to your office, no need to go home. 
You see, the, the kingdom does not replace the family. The family is the foundation of God's kingdom work. Just as the office does not replace your house. Some people put an office in their basement, but you don't turn your office to your house. It's a separation. And so God wants us to build a house of rest so that his kingdom can come on earth, so that his will can come on earth, so that we can do what Jesus did in the season of rest. When evening had come, many who were demon possessed were set free. He cast out spirits with the word. He healed all who were sick. The time of evening, he said, let us cross over. In the season of rest, we will remember God's promises. Don't let the storm make you forget his promises. In the season of rest, you can learn how to enter his peace and be a son and daughter of peace. So, how does God build a house of rest? Jesus, how was Jesus built? Jesus was good, right? He grew up. He was a baby. He was born. He grew up from just like all of us. You know how Jesus grew up? It says in Luke, I think chapter 2, it says he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So Jesus had to grow in wisdom. No wonder by wisdom the house is built. He's the builder of his house. And just as he grew in wisdom, he wants us to grow in wisdom. Right? By wisdom the house is built. Solomon was a man of wisdom. So there is no rest without wisdom. There's no provision and blessing without wisdom. It's a threefold call. Rest, wisdom, and provision. Job 28, 28. Very easy. 28, 28. And to man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. You know what's very powerful for the season? Many of us are putting all our trust in sanitizers, not satanizers. Okay. Masks. What else? Distancing. And the final, yes, we think the answer to the pandemic, vaccination. Is that where the source of our trust is? I'm not saying anything wrong with all this. Yes, please continue wearing a mask, keep your distance. But unless God protects you, all this is useless. Do it, but remember, that's not the source of your protection. God is your protection. And so this is the verse for this season. Proverbs 19.23. You know the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? But listen to this. Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life. What's the pandemic doing? Taking out life. Choking people. It's like a suffocate from the inside. They gasp in fire. They can't breathe. But the fear of the Lord leads to life. And he who has it, that's what the fear of God, will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. No COVID can visit you. No virus or bacteria can visit you. Who? The fear of the Lord leads to life, not vitamin C, plenty of sleep, drink plenty of water leads to life. That water is life, right? No, no, no. Again, I'm not saying be foolish or be callous. But I'm just saying, where is your trust? Where is the source of your trust? The word of God says, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. Unless the Lord what builds the house, we labor made to build it. And let the Lord watch Penang, we leave the watchman watch in vain. So, how do we, what house does God build? A house of rest. What's the foundation of the house of rest? The fear of God. That leads to wisdom. Built by wisdom, the house is built. So, the question now is what is wisdom? It has nothing to do with how smart, clever we are, nothing to do with our brain. You know, wisdom has all to do with our heart. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Describes what wisdom is. You know, some people think, oh, if you are if you are very clever, you're very wise. No. IQ and wisdom are nothing to do with each other. Let me read James chapter 3. You get an idea what, what wisdom is. This who is in verse 13? Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good con conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. How to show? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. You know what meekness is? That is often say meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength under control. It's like that word there, the last root. What's the last root? How I many you know that a horse? I don't know if you saw the equestrian. I love watching it in the Olympics, you know. Fantastic, yeah. the horse, every foot. I say, how can this huge, strong animal? So much more stronger than the rider. Every foot is controlled like a dance. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, in the Olympics, 
the question even. And how is that horse controlled? Where is the point of control of the horse? The bit in the mouth. And the little bit in the mouth, the rider holds the, the reins, they can control every step like a dance. They'll be trotting, first the jump, first the left, front left leg, and then the back right leg, and then the front right leg, and the back left leg. Do you think, how can you fine tune a horse to be so obedient? Every foot in submission. It says, who is wise in understanding? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness, strength under control. That horse in the Olympics, very strong, but under control, are the rider. Huh? Controlled by the mouth. It doesn't say, let him show by his intelligence that his works are done. No. It doesn't say, let him show by how clever he is. It's in the meekness of wisdom. Verse 14. For if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. And here's what wisdom is. Wisdom that is from above, from God, is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good truths, without partiality, that means without prejudice or bias, and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So, by wisdom, the house is built. In other words, by the fruit of the Spirit, the house is built. Or by the Christ-like character, the house is built. So how do we bear the fruit of the Spirit? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of character. We don't fear God, we will not have the fruit of the Spirit. We will not have character. You know, sometimes the key to the key to wisdom is not um, not having the negatives, but having the positives. What did Galatians say? Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It does not say don't fulfill the lust of the flesh and you walk in the Spirit. Focus on the truth. Walk in the Spirit, and then the flesh will take care of itself. You won't have to worry about that. Speak life, and you won't speak negative. Focus on truth. So, for us to become a house of rest, because they have the fear of God to influence our character, to walk in love. Somebody said, I think it was a, one of the messages said, if you need patience, don't pray for patience, pray for love, because love is patient. The love is the seed, patience is the fruit. If you need uh, kindness, don't pray for kindness, pray for love, because love is kind. So, don't pray against God, I rebuke impatience. No, no, God, put me with your love. You become impatient. You say, God, you know, the cast is out of love. Grow in love and the fruit will come. So, don't come. Many of us spend more time coming against the negative than praying for the positive. When you have the seed of love, all the fruit will be there. How many times we're coming against a lack of fruit and we, it's the seed that's the problem. So, when we build a house of rest, we've got to ask the Lord to. Build us in his love. That's why the disciples had no peace. Why? Jesus was asleep, but they couldn't enter his rest. And the word of God says, how do we enter his rest? Jesus says, if you abide in me, that means abide in my rest, and I and my words in you, whatever you ask shall be done. So how are the disciples meant to abide in Jesus' rest? By abiding, by putting him on. What do I need to put on? You know, when you put on a garment, you're inside the garment, right? You're inside whatever you put on. Do you remember the blessing that Jacob got that was meant for his brother? How did Jacob steal his brother's blessing? He put on his brother's garment. What did, what did Isaac say? Hey, how come your voice is like Esau? But um, no, your voice is Jacob, but your, your hand is just like Esau, very heavy. So Jacob stole his brother's birthright by what he put on. So the blessing of the father was not based on the character of Jacob, but the garment he put on. How many know that we are blessed, not because we are perfect, but when we are in Christ? And here's the problem. Christ is in every believer, but not every believer is in Christ. All the Egyptians came out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in all their hearts, except for Joshua and Caleb. See, by salvation, we come out of Egypt, but through discipleship, Egypt comes out of us. And we are, when we get saved, Christ comes in us. But when we are matured and transformed, we are growing in Christ. You learn to abide in Him. What else does the Bible say about being in Christ? If any man be in Christ, he is a... So just Christ in you doesn't make you new. You say, oh yeah, he says he's a Christian, but no change. Ah, you know what? He's not in Christ. Christ may be in him, but he's not in Christ. How do you be in Christ? Put him on. Abide in him. Stay in his word. Reflect on his word. 
And that's the, where the fear of God begins. So when you remember what the fear of God is and you're tempted to not walk in love, you're tempted to lose your patience or be unkind or whatever it is, you remember, hey, I have to abide in this love. I would exercise self-control, meekness. But like the horse, meekness, which is a fruit of wisdom. So the house of God is built by wisdom. It is established by understanding. Understanding of what? What are we supposed to understand? You need to know this verse, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Jeremiah 9 says, Yes, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But, but what? Verse 20. Glory, glory in his Right. That him who glories, glory in this, Jeremiah 9 24, that he understands and knows me. Not that he understands and knows every verse in the Bible, that he knows so much, they got PhD in theology. No, do we know him? You know, it's possible to know. Just because you know a book very well, you know the whole story, you know everything in the book, doesn't mean you know the author. Right? Everybody can know a book by buying it or reading it online. But very few know the author of the book. You know what? There's no difference in the body of Christ. There are too many Christians who know what is written, but they don't know the author. They have eyes to read the printed page, but no ears to hear the voice. Why? Because Jesus is in them, but they're not in Christ. It's only when you're in Christ, you abide in Him, you hear what He's speaking through His Word. And it's only when you hear his voice through his word can we be changed to his image. So by wisdom, it is built by understanding the house is established. The foundation is strong. How I many you know you need strong foundation in the shaking? The times of shaking that we're living in. You need to have a strong foundation. Do you know the Lord or Jesus know what he's, he said before? You know, when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he said, turn these stones into bread. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from very important. You know how many Christians say? But by every word that proceeds from Genesis to Revelation. But they don't know anything from the mouth of God. You know, Jesus had the Old Testament. He had the Torah. He read from Isaiah in the temple. But he didn't say that. He didn't say, man shall live by everything written by the law and the prophets. He said, no. By everything spoken from the mouth of God. And that's how we abide in him. Because if you can't hear his voice and all you do is go the written word, guess what you're leaning on? Your own understanding. And Proverbs 3 says, lean not on your own understanding. No point knowing the Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, even the devil knows all that. He knows more theology than you do. But he never protected his heart. You see, it's not the knowledge of the word, it's the transformation of the heart. Not the head full of the letter, but without the spirit. And this is what the difference is between Christ in us and we in Christ. The house that God builds is the house where we are abiding in His rest. So that we can be a house of rest. So that we can have the authority to speak to the storm. Right? Isaiah 33, verse 6 says, Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times. When do we need stability in unstable times? How I many you know that we are living in unstable times? So how are we going to be strong? How are we going to be anchored? Wisdom and knowledge. Where does wisdom come from? Or what is wisdom? The fruit of the Spirit. Where does it come from? The fear of God. Wisdom and knowledge of what? Do you know who God is? Are you abiding in Him? That will keep you stable in unstable times. It is the strength of salvation. So these are very two important scriptures for this season, Megan. Proverbs 19.23 and Isaiah 33.6. Acts 9.31 says, The churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Walking in the fear of God and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. So, how many know what the days would be like when Jesus comes? Matthew 24 and Luke 17 says it would be like the days of Noah. It would be like the days of Lot. What were the days of Noah? Everybody eating, drinking. Sounds a bit like when the pandemic came. You know when the pandemic came last year? Around Chinese New Year. Everybody eating, drinking. Long si pa choy, boom. 
pandemic came, one taken, one left behind. In the days of Noah. The greatest deception is everything is so good. Then you say it's so good to be true. And the Lord will come and no one expects. Just as the pandemic came and no one expected. And so what is God looking for? He says, look, I, God is looking for a house that will be a house of rest before he comes. I'm, isn't Noah so happy that, that the flood came after he completed the ark? That's the faithfulness of God. God said, Noah, I'm coming on this day whether you're ready or not. And then the rains come. Hey, God, I haven't put the roof yet. No, no. God was waiting for Noah to finish the ark. So when the house of the Lord is complete, the Lord will come. So in a way, we are delaying his coming. I was saying, look, when are you going to finish my house so I can come back? The Bible says, heaven is holding back Jesus until the restoration of all things. He's waiting for his house to be built. He doesn't want to send down his rain and you have no roof on your house. Many Christians think, God send down the fire, but you got no fireplace. You know what happens when you have fire without fireplace? You have a burnt down house. You, have, you need an altar for fire. You need a fireplace for fire. To keep you warm. The fire to keep you warm will burn everything down if you don't have a fireplace. So why is, you know, you think God come quickly, he says, I'm waiting for you to build a house of rest. Because I had to wait for Noah to complete the ark before I send the rain. You know when God sent down fire to burn Sodom and Gomorrah? After Lot had left. God did say, Lot, calm down, let's start. If you're not in or out of your house, I'm sending down the fire. Quick, God, get out so that I can destroy the city. How much more merciful will God be to his people? If God is willing for, to wait for Noah to complete the ark, if God is willing to wait for Lot to leave, surely he will protect us before judgment. But we must be faithful to build his house of rest. How he builds his house upon sons of peace, like Jesus, like Solomon. Sons of peace are those who walk in wisdom. The character of Christ through the fear of the Lord. Wisdom and knowledge of who he is is the stability of their times. And so we need to allow the peace of God to rest upon us. So what was the difference between Jesus and the disciples of the boat? When Jesus slept, was he looking at the wind and the waves? Was he like looking, admiring the storm around him? No, his eyes were closed. What were the disciples doing? They were not looking at Christ. They were looking at the weather. Ah, oh, they're so, look, 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 look. So how did God want to protect us? Protect us, be your sons and daughters of peace. Don't look at the weather, look at my face. Hey, imagine the disciples said, but Lord, if we look at you, huh, we're denying that the weather is bad. We have to be realistic. We have to admit that it's bad weather. You know, you know who are the most realistic people? The most unbelieving people. Because their, their face is not on the Lord, but on the weather, on the circumstances. The pastor, you know how bad. In fact, funny because uh, the very thing that Bill Johnson told me in person, 2009 or 2010 in Sydney, Lee Fadlin just told me personally a few days ago. He just sent me this text, which I actually posted on the Prayer United WhatsApp. I want to read you what, uh, what Lee Fadlin sent me. I think last week, about the very thing. He said, the intercessor is God-centered. He's not problem-focused. He has a vision of what God can do. When no intercessor can be found among God's people, it is a mark of failure in our responsibility to God. So here's the difference. The intercessor is God-centered. He's not problem-focused. What were the children, what were the disciples doing? Problem-focused. Master, wake up. We don't care. We're perishing. You know what would happen if they focused on the peace of God? They would have ended it. And then they would have the peace to speak peace in the storm. You see, if you're not focused on the goodness of God, you'll be focused on the darkness of the circumstances. On the darkness of, God, why you're not doing this? Why this prayer hasn't been answered? Why God, you haven't done this? Why God, this person like that, that person like this? What, is, what was the temptation of Eve? Eve, what has God not given you? He immediately shifted her focus from what God gave, gave her to what he did not give her. That's what he wants to do. John the Baptist in prison. The devil said, John the Baptist, focus on your ceiling, walls, and get offended with God. So John the Baptist said, hey, was he really Jesus? I better send my disciples to find out. So what did Jesus tell the disciples of John? Go and tell John to look out his prison cell. To look at me. The blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear. And blessed is the man who's not offended. You know why many are offended? They're looking at their circumstances. They're not looking at the Lord. So in a time of shaking, if you want to be a son and daughter of peace, you need to guard your focus. You need to guard your focus. Wisdom and knowledge of the stability of your times. You need to release peace. Put on the garment of praise. You know, God wants to protect our city. He wants to protect Malaysia. He wants to protect the nations. How is he going to protect the nations? 
He wants to build a wall, a wall of salvation. You know how God's going to build a wall of salvation? He needs a gate of praise. Last verse. Isaiah 60, verse 18. Isaiah, 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 or Isaiah, Isaiah 60, verse 18 says, Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, nor wasting or destruction within your borders, but you shall call your wall salvation and your gates praise. How is wasting and destruction happening today? Mainly through the pandemic, right? Violence will not be heard in your land, nor wasting or destruction, but you shall call your wall salvation and your gates praise. Who is the gate? What is the gate? You and I are the gates. We are the gate of heaven and the house of God. You know what happens when you become a gate of praise? You begin to fulfill Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, O your gates. Be lifted up, the everlasting doors, that the King of glory come in. So we need to look up at the face of the goodness of God and say, God, I'm not going to be distracted by what the devil is doing. Oh, this is what Bill Johnson told me, right? When I met him in 2009 and 2010 in Sydney, he said, I started to complain to him about Penang. And I said, you know, Penang is very hard. How do I, how do we, how do we fulfill God's will in Penang? And he said, look, don't be distracted by what the devil is doing. But live in response to the goodness of God. He said, Jesus never ministered in reaction to the devil's works. Jesus ministered in response to the Father's voice. And as long as you're distracted by what is not right, what is not good, what is going wrong, you can never walk in peace. You can never be at peace. You'll always be losing your peace because everything is wrong. But when you focus on him and you get peace, now you can speak to what is wrong and release shalom. You see, Jesus, when he saw the storm, what did he do? He didn't say, I command you, storm, go away. No, he said, shalom. You know? When the, at night time, when you come here and you can't see anything, you command the darkness to go. Darkness, I command you to leave this office. No, you turn on the light. Right? You don't spend 10 hours of warfare against the darkness. You just see the light. So many Christians today are coming against darkness more than being the light. How do we be the light? Plant the daughters of peace. Abide in distress. Put on the garment of praise. Become the gate of praise so that the prison walls, they fall in silence, to become a wall of salvation. Remember Paul and Silas? They were, they were taken prisoner. And the pain and discomfort, darkness all around, the midnight hour, they began to praise how they sought the face of God. They weren't distracted by everything that went wrong. They didn't complain, God, we serve you faithfully. Why are we persecuted like this? Why are we arrested? And when they began to praise, the sacrifice of praise, their prison walls became a wall of salvation. The chains broke, the doors opened, the Philippine jailer was saved. Was saved. So this is our assignment for this season. God's assignment for the church. God is allowing the shaking to reveal our foundation. He wants us to remember the promises. They've been across over to the other side. Why is the shaking happening? I believe one reason is the devil knows what's ahead. The devil has heard the promises of God for our nations. He's heard the prophecies and he sees the direction we are headed. He says, I'm going to stand the storm and shake those who can be shaken. And so in this last year and this year, many believers like the disciples are terrified and taken over by fear. But yet Jesus is with us. See, the presence of Jesus in the boat doesn't mean there'll be no storms. Just because God is with you doesn't mean you have no problems, but it does mean you can now enter his rest. And so because the enemy knows what is waiting, that he's in trouble, there's a mighty move of God is coming. He's trying to shake God's people in fear. And so many of God's people are distracted by the storm. They're distracted by the COVID. But God wants us to build a house of rest by entering his peace, becoming sons and daughters of peace, so that his peace will rest upon us, the house of peace. Remember when, when during the Passover, where was the place of refuge? The house. The blood was put on the door of the house because the lamb was inside. How was the family of Noah saved? In the ark. How was the household of Rahab saved? In a house on the walls of Jericho. It was not individual by individual. Can you imagine if everybody told uh, Abraham, uh, you know, in the Passover, I don't, I, I'm too busy to go home. How's not important? Like, it's all about the blood. Just put the blood on my head and run out of the place. Isn't that what many people are saying? No need the house, just the blood is on me. God loves me, I love God, I don't need community, I don't need family. It was because of, the, of, of Noah's peace, his family were blessed. But unfortunately, though Lord was saved, his sons in law didn't believe him. Though Jesus was in the boat, his disciples still had no peace. So it's one thing to have the presence of God, it's another thing to enter his rest. Christ is in us all, but are we in Christ? Are we abiding in his love and cast out fear? 
Are we abiding in His peace? Are we abiding in His rest? And so God wants us to have the peace and joy of the Lord. That's why Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Don't seek first to change circumstances. Seek my peace from my presence. Seek my joy. And when you have it, now circumstances will change. Now you can say shalom to the mountain. Shalom to the pandemic. Shalom to the house, to Penang, to Malaysia. Amen? And when God says, oh, finally, my people are becoming a house of rest. Finally, they're becoming sons or daughters in peace. Now I can get ready to come. Because now I'm preparing a bride without spot in them. And guess what? Before the Lord returns, what did he tell Peter? I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church that the Lord is building. What's the gates of hell? A house of peace. Because he said, it is to the church, the wisdom of God will be made known to principalities and powers. The wisdom of God, the character of Christ, will intimidate the enemy. That the gates of hell cannot prevail. And God says, now you're ready to crush the enemy under your shoes of peace. Isn't that amazing? The God of peace will crush Satan, not the God of war. Many are trying to crush Satan by fighting him instead of entering God's peace. There's no authority without peace. Because peace means fullness, completeness, shalom. So it's the God of peace, not the God of war, that will crush Satan under your feet. Make sure you're not barefoot. Okay, what are you supposed to wear? Shoes of the gospel of peace. And therein is your authority. Shoes of the gospel of peace. And that's how we abide in Christ. We abide in his presence. We live in thanksgiving and praise. We live in, thank in gratitude. We say, God, I thank you for your promises. You said that is crossover. You gave Dr. Joy this vision of revival in Penang. I know we're going to cross over. These are the promises of Malaysia, Rainbow Nation. We're going to cross over. I refuse to be distracted by the storm. I'm going to enter your rest. I'm going to speak peace to Malaysia. And you pour out your spirit. Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you for reminding us of all the promises and prophecies that you've given us. Remind us of all our testimonies, Lord. Forgive us if we've been distracted by what the enemy is doing and entered unbelief and entered stress and, and, and fear and anxiety and worry. Lord, we want to be sons and daughters of peace to build you a house of rest, to abide in your love, to cast out fear, to abide in your peace, to abide in your presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace that we can put on the garment of praise, the robe of righteousness, the garment of salvation. As we become a gate of praise, we say, we lift up our heads as gates, lift up the, as doors, Lord, we say, King of glory, come in. When you stand at the gate, no enemy can come in. When you stand at the gate, our walls become walls of salvation, Lord. So we thank you, Father. We welcome you to our lives, to our homes, to this church, to every house in Global Harvest, Penang, to every house in Penang, in Malaysia. We say, King of glory, come in. We want to build you a house of rest, surrounded by walls of salvation, the gates of praise. We put on the, the garment of praise, Lord, and we speak peace to this land. We speak peace to our own hearts, to those in our house. We speak peace to every house in Global Harvest, every church in this nation, Lord, in the nations, Lord. We say shalom, and we thank you, Lord, that you who began a good work are faithful to complete it. And you're faithful to complete it, Lord, and then you will come. You're restoring all things, Lord. We thank you, Father, for performing your word, fulfilling your word. You said, believe the Lord and you'll be established. Believe with prophets and you will prosper. So we believe you, Lord. And we, are, and, and we are established. We believe your prophets and we prosper. We thank you for building us wisdom, establishing us on understanding to know who you are, not just to have the hidden knowledge of your word, but to have the transforming knowledge of hearing your voice, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the grace to understand you, that you are the Lord exercising loving kindness and tender mercies. The throne is the throne of mercy and grace, not the throne of judgment, because we are not where you want us to be yet. We thank you, Lord, that loving kindness and tender mercies go before you. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning, and goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. So, Father, we thank you for being a good father to us. Forgive us, Lord, for being distracted. We want to focus on you. We seek your face, Lord, so we can be sons and daughters of peace, so we can build you a house of rest, that all those in darkness can come to the place of rest, even as Noah was, as Lot was, as his daughters, as Rahab was, Lord, even the Philippine jailer to his family, as of Zacchaeus to his family, Lord, even during the Passover, as the 12 tribes were a house of rest. We thank you, Lord, that even as you come, Rick, Lord, you will find a house of rest in the days of Noah. You'll find a house of rest in the days of Lot, because you're building us as sons and daughters of peace, even as you raise Solomon, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for your provision. We thank you, Father, for grace. 
He said, it is you at work in us, you will endure according to good pleasure. To continue to transform our hearts, renew our minds, that your kingdom come and will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. God is good.